Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump right into the program for today. And I'd like to introduce first Peter Henry, Vice Chair of the Economic Club of New York, uh, and um, former Dean of NYU Stern School of Business. Peter? Thank you, Barbara, and good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we've got a terrific conversation planned for you this morning. And I want to just briefly introduce our distinguished guest. Uh, Robert Kaplan has served as the 13th President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas since September 8, 2015. He represents the 11th Federal Reserve District on the Federal Open Market Committee in the formulation of US monetary policy and oversees the 1,200 employees of the Dallas Fed. President Kaplan was previously the Martin Marshall Professor of Management Practice at Harvard Business School and is the author of several books, including What You Really Need to Lead, The Power of Thinking and Acting Like an Owner, What You're Really Meant to Do, A Roadmap for Reaching Your Unique Potential, and What to Ask the Person in the Mirror, Critical Questions for Becoming a More Effective Leader and Reaching Your Potential. The what books. <laughs> and I look forward to talking about uh, leadership in the context of uh, your, your current role as well. Prior to joining Harvard in 2006, President Kaplan was Vice Chairman of Goldman, Goldman Sachs with responsibility for investment ma banking and investment management and a member of the firm's management committee. President Kaplan serves as Chairman of Project ALS and Co-Chairman of the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, a global venture philanthropy firm that invests in developing nonprofit enterprises dedicated to addressing social issues. He's also a board member of Harvard Medical School. <clears throat> and prior to his role at the Dallas Fed, President Kaplan served on a number of uh, corporate boards, including, among others, State Street Corporation, Harvard, Man Harvard Management Company, Bed Bath & Beyond, and Hydric and & Struggles. President Kaplan was born in Prairie Village, Kansas, received a BS from the University of Kansas, an MBA from Harvard Business School. Please join me in giving President yeah. Kaplan a warm ECNY Thank you. welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Peter. Great to see you. Yeah. Great to have you here. So let's jump right in. There's okay. a lot to talk about. Um, yep. So let's start with Texas. Uh, the U.S. is a $19 trillion economy. Texas is about 10% of that. Uh, there's a small renegotiation of a, some sort of a trade right. deal that happened recently. <laughs> uh, it's called something called NAFTA. Right. Any implications for Texas? How, yeah. do, you, how do you see things? Sure. And uh, verse, Texas is the largest exporting state in the United States. So trade is a very important part of uh, Texas GDP. Uh, we, we, um, we are glad, uh, and I am glad for the United States, as much as for Texas, that we have renegotiated uh, the agreements with Mexico and Canada. And the reason why, we've been saying that we do a lot of work at the Dallas Fed on trade. And we've been saying for quite some time to elected officials, appointed officials, both sides of the aisle, that we ought to be segmenting our trade relationships in the United States. And in particular, what I'm saying is the trade relationship, for example, with Mexico is an intermediate goods relationship. 70% mm -hmm. of the imports from Mexico are intermediate goods, logistics supply chain arrangements that our research shows make the US more competitive, add jobs to the United States. And so uh, Canada, to a lesser extent, about 50% intermediate goods, the trade relationship with China, for example, is almost an entirely a final goods trade mm -hmm. relationship. So we felt very strongly we ought to be shoring up North America and thinking of North America as a competitive hemisphere. And we believe because of these intermediate good relationships in this hemisphere, we have been gaining share that we would otherwise lose most likely to China. So yes, we're glad about that. It removes a uh, uncertainty. By and large, though, talking about Texas generally, the story of Texas mm -hmm. over the last 20 years is a story of migration of people and firms to the state. And I say migration from within the United States. Mm -hmm. Yes, globally, but heavily from within the United States. Texas population has gone from 22 and a half million 10 years ago on its way to 29. And our own research in conjunction with McKinsey and others is in the next 20 years, Texas may well get to in the neighborhood of 40 million people. Now, just to put, yes, and to put this in context, our big concern about many states and the United States generally is aging population mm -hmm. and slowing population growth. Most valuable thing I've learned a city or a state or a country can have is population and growing population, which translates into a growing workforce. Texas has that, not as much because of organic growth, but a lot of it is migration. 
and that migration continues. There are many states in this country that I think population over the next 10 years is going to be flat to down. Germany is likely to mm -hmm. shrink. Japan population likely to shrink. Has We'll talk about in a moment when we get to the country, has big implications. So the story of Texas is migration and diversification. Uh, people think of Texas, they think of energy. And the truth is energy is now is a little, little less than 9% of the state's GDP. And obviously energy has gone from being a headwind in 2014 and 15, 16, uh, to being a tailwind right now. And we can talk more about why that is. Uh, but we've got a vibrant uh, tech center, uh, segment, we've got lots of uh, uh, industries being developed, and four of the big cities in the state are four of the biggest cities and fastest growing cities in the United States, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and Austin. Uh, and while Hurricane Harvey put a little bit of a mm -hmm. dent in Houston, we, as we predicted, we'd bounce back. So job growth in the state of Texas year to date annualized is about 3.6%. Job growth. Well, that means GDP growth is in well in excess of 4%. Okay, not, that's real. Add 2% for inflation. And so we're growing at a faster pace than the rest of the country. And because of this migration and growing workforce, um, we actually expect these trends will continue. So uh, if you had to play a hand in the United States among states, Texas is a pretty good hand to play. But again, a lot of it is, is uh, going to... is a it, is what's going right for Texas is a little bit some of the concerns about the U.S. Growing population, growing workforce versus many other states and the country where that is slowing. That's a big story of Texas, though. So let's, let's build on that a little bit because it's, it's really interesting to think about <clears throat> migration, diversification as drivers of the economy, and particularly in migration that's happening to Texas from other parts of the country, and I, I assume lots from the region. What can we learn from Texas to generalize to the country more broadly as to sort of how to be a, a vibrant business environment? So, so the things that are uh, part of the reason for the magnet, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, there's, there's, there's limits to this, it's a relatively speaking low regulation state. Mm -hmm. If you want to start a business, you want to get fees, license, it's faster by and large from our work in Texas than many other states. Uh, Obviously, don't, there's no state income tax, mm -hmm. um, and, but the, the reason the state is able to manage that is we have a higher sales tax than other states, and we've got the energy industry. So you get the royalty tax from energy. So we, we, about 70% of the energy growth in the United States comes from Texas. So we have something that many other states don't and allows the state to keep uh, income taxes very low. Uh, the other thing I would say, central location, which matters for a business mm -hmm. from a logistics uh, point of view. Uh, and lastly, I would say the culture. Having lived there now, it is, I've lived a number of places. It's welcoming, pro-business, uh, can-do attitude. The chambers of commerce uh, and others are uh, very strong in making you feel welcome. A lot of the CEOs that I know in the state did not come from Texas. And then the last thing I'd say that the state has done a good job of, it's got some things it doesn't do well, is skills training. Mm. I'm going to talk as we get yep. along. Skills training is critical. And we're, we're not perfect in Texas, but Dallas Community College, El Paso Community College, Greater Houston Partnership are doing a lot to train automotive technicians, IT specialists, pipe fitters, oil field service workers, you name it. And part of a vibrant state, I think if you want to have a vibrant city or state in the years to come, your junior colleges and to some extent high schools have got to do a much better job um, in closing the skills gap and training skills workers. On the flip side, the state does not, it still has got a challenge. Our education, math, science, and reading lag the rest of the country. country. This country lags the world, we lag the country. If we don't address this, it will hurt the future growth. There's environmental issues, there's infrastructure issues when you're growing this fast. Um, and so we've got a number of challenges, but the nice thing, the culture of the place, and we're part of this discussion at the Fed, is I think leaders, including the governor, we actively and pretty bluntly, business leaders, mayors, the governor, Fed's involved in this, confront these issues and talk about them, uh, which makes me more hopeful that we'll actually do some things to solve them. But I'd say for the state, education is the one right now that worries me the most. 
Well, I think it's good, it's a good segue into broader issues you want to talk about with respect to monetary policy. And one of the key issues in thinking about monetary policy, obviously, is is the labor force <clears throat> and thinking about potential output. Uh, so you talked about education and in, in Texas, but help us think a little more broadly about the about the broader labor market. So unemployment is at almost record lows, or below four percent. And you sort of touched on this issue of you know um, how much more can employment grow yeah. without the labor market tightening up, and education is obviously a big part of that. So, so let me put this in context. So GDP growth uh, in the United States, we believe our every Federal Reserve Bank does its own forecasts. Our forecast for GDP growth for this year, 2018, is about is, is about three percent. Uh, and we've, we have felt all through the year that we're going to have a strong year for GDP growth in the U.S. And as you mentioned, unemployment's now 3.7. Inflation rate is a little above 2. Mm -hmm. And so we believe the Fed is, is reaching its dual mandate objectives. Um, now, if you analyze this GDP growth this year, where is it coming from? Um, on the demand side, more government spending. Mm -hmm. There's no question. Net change of government spending is adding some fraction to GDP. Uh, business investment is higher, although a, a, a healthy chunk of that is energy. Not all of it, but a chunk of it is energy. Uh, consumer solid, and we believe the consumer in the United States is in good shape. Uh, been spending the last eight or nine years deleveraging. Uh, but to your point, uh, the other thing that's been going on on the supply side is population still growing, 16 year olds and above by our estimate about eight-tenths of a percent. We get, mm -hmm. So we get about eight-tenths of a percent growth from, popu from population. Uh, hours worked have been going up in 17 and 18. For those who watch the job growth numbers, not that the job growth has been that much higher. Hours worked have been climbing. Uh, and as the unemployment rate goes down, it means a higher percentage of the workforce is employed. Participation rate hadn't gone, but we're getting, so we're getting, let's say, one and a half percent this year, 1.6 percent from growth in the workforce and hours mm -hmm. and participation, uh, it, it, people working. And then the rest of it has to come from productivity. Mm -hmm. We were talking before this, roll forward now to 19 and 20, um, we think this fiscal stimulus, uh, at least the part that was a spending increase or a tax cut funded by the deficit, we expected it would give us a short-term bump. We're at the height of that right now. We'll get some positive effect, we think, in 19, but it will begin to fade. Mm -hmm. It will fade further in 20. And going back to, again, GDP, by the way, in the United States is made up of growth in the workforce and growth in productivity. You need one or both. Uh, those two add up. And w w let's go through the workforce estimate for next year. We still think population is going to grow 16-year-olds 16, 16 and above, about 8.85%. 8, so we'll get that. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we think we're at about the end of the road on hours worked. We're not mm -hmm. sure there's enough capacity for people to work more hours. The unemployment rate has been going down, and it will still go down, but not as fast. We won't get the big jumps down we've gotten. So we'll get a little less growth from the workforce. And by the way, because the population is aging, uh, participation rate, we believe, over the next few years could actually start to decline. That would actually be a drag mm -hmm. on GDP growth. So then the question is, can you make up for that in higher productivity than what we've had? We've had higher productivity this year than we've had over the last 10 years on average. And, the only, and we're hopeful, and the Fed economists, I think, would say, we're not, what, we're not great. Maybe, we're not great at forecasting a lot of it, but we're not great at forecasting productivity. Uh, Having said that, what's your rough estimate? Well, for this here's, year? Our, here's our. It's been running about, on average, I think about 1% mm -hmm. growth the last um, 10 years. I think this year is closer to 1.5. Mm -hmm. the, the only concern we have, we're hopeful it can grow. The reasons it might not go back to, then it gets to your question, long winded answer to your question education. Uh, we, we are 25th out of 35 industrialized nations in math, science, and reading. I don't, and a lot of us sit there and go, when did that happen? I thought we were better than that. Mm -hmm. Well, we've been eroding. And we've got a very large skills gap in the United States, which means half, more than half of all small businesses say they can't find skilled workers. Every one of those jobs that goes unfilled is lower productivity. You go from, it's not that, it, it doesn't grow the workforce, but if you go from this amount job to a skilled job, you're gonna be more productive, we'll have higher, and we have not grown our skills training in this country fast enough 
to keep up with this trend. So the skill gap we think is growing, and with technology, the, the skills training for most middle skills jobs has, have gone up a lot. So what we've been saying is, um, We've got to do more to improve math, science, and reading. It's not going to be an overnight fix. It's going to take years. Starts with zero to five pre-K. Too many kids in this country, including in Dallas. Our estimate is in the city of Dallas, one in three kids is growing up in poverty. We're pretty confident if you grow up in poverty, you'll start mm -hmm. first grade behind grade level. And if you start behind grade level, you never catch up. And GDP for a generation is lower. And so we think we got to beef up pre-K in the United States, particularly for at-risk kids. Um, this is a structural change. Mm -hmm. Fed doesn't get involved, but we got to call it out. Um, and then skills training is more of a quicker fix. Every high school and junior college in this country, we think best practice today is go out and interview businesses in your community and backward integrate into your curriculum. And not enough, I would argue, not enough uh, education leaders are doing that, but we've got to move faster uh, if we're going to grow productivity. Otherwise, GDP growth is going to be, is going to, and our base case is going to be a little bit lower next year than this year and trail back down to 2%, which we think is potential. If we improve math, science, and reading, if we improve skills training, maybe we can get more productivity growth. And maybe there's a catch up. We'll, we'll have to see. And then the other thing we've said, and while it goes without saying a controversial subject, uh, we, have been, we do a lot of work on immigration research at the Dallas Fed, and we've said it would help if we can find ways to grow the workforce. Now, that may be getting people off disability, back into the workforce, lots of other things, but, but we So get think, that 0.85 number up. You got it. <laughs> but we think immigration, we just want to call it out. Mm -hmm. Half of the workforce growth in the United States over the last 20 years have been immigrants and their children. We think it will be higher in the next 20 years. That surprises people. But immigration is critical to GDP growth because we need workforce growth. And we've been saying at Dallas Fed, uh, we've done a lot of work that has suggested and indicated, Pia Arrhenius, who does this for us, that we would be well served to adopt a system more like Canada's where we, um, we have more skills-based and employer-based immigration. We go out and interview employers around the country and backward integrate into our criteria. But if, you, if we think, we've also said to officials, if you think you're gonna cut immigration and grow GDP, as I've just explained, those two things don't go together. Absolutely. If you're doing that, you better hope that productivity is gonna jump and we've got to improve education and skills training to help make that more likely. Infrastructure spending would also be helpful. By the way, we think we're about $3 trillion underinvested. But that's the kind of dilemma, at least as we sit at the Dallas Fed, we're watching and trying to understand. Uh, we don't have all the answers, but these are some of the questions and issues we're wrestling with. I want to come back to some of those structural issues in a, in a bit. But you've really, I think, framed the, the landscape for us very well in terms of you know, helping us understand what are the, the factors that the Fed has to take as given, even as you're out using your bully pulpit to try to educate the public, officials in particular, about the need to, to pull some of these, these longer run structural right. levers. But as we come to the kind of where we are right now, <laughs> uh, and you look at the landscape, <clears throat> look at the inflation numbers, we're getting pretty close to the, to the high end of, of, of the target, 2%. Yep. Amazon just raised this minimum wage to $15 an hour. Yep. You talked about tightening labor markets. Uh, August, the, 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 the inflation numbers were all-time high. They came down in September. So we could kind of a mixed picture. How do you see where we are in terms of uh, the inflation? Picture? So here's how we see inflation. And I would say I would describe it a tale of two conflicting, colliding forces. On the one hand, there's no question cyclical pressures, mm -hmm. inflationary pressures, we believe, are building. The cyclical pressures. What do I mean by cyclical? Tight labor market. Uh, the tariffs, steel, aluminum, input costs, oil prices being higher. There's no question. Every business I talk to, and I talk to about 30 CEOs a month, uh, and we do broad surveys, input costs are going up. And companies, for the first time since I've been in this job, are saying, I'm going to try to raise prices. Certain mm -hmm. industries are confident that they'll stick. <laughs> Other industries, particularly consumer-facing mm -hmm. companies, right. are saying, we may try, but I don't know if, it, if we can, we may just have margin erosion. This is why you're seeing so much merger activity, by the way, right. is that people don't know they have pricing power. But uh, 
So the cyclical forces suggest to me, particularly the, including the tariffs, suggest that cyclical forces are building. Uh, on the wage side, by the way, I'd say most pronounced, this is in our state, no question, 10 to $15 an hour, there's wage pressure. If you're a skilled worker, people are paying up, bonuses, you mm -hmm. name it, to get skilled workers. In the middle is a little more ambiguous from what I'm, what I'm seeing. If you make 20 to $25 an hour with benefits at a good company, uh, what I'm hearing across the board is people are much more taken into account is how good, what's going to happen to this company in the next downturn. Paid leave, other benefits, promotion opportunities, and also there's the threat which I'm, is, is, of, of technology-enabled disruptions. That gets me, those are the cyclical forces, then there, which I'll get to, the structural pressures I think are more deflationary, and th those are in particular uh, automation, in other words, I, I refer to it as technology-enabled disruption, automation, and to some extent globalization. Those forces are limiting the pricing power of businesses, um, are causing businesses to replace people with technology, uh, are a counterforce to the negotiating leverage. If you work in a call center in this country and make $55,000 a year, here's a good chance, based on my conversation, your job ain't gonna exist five to seven years from now. Technology will replace you. You may well find another job, uh, but unless you get retrained, uh, you know, you may make less money. So those forces of, um, of technology-enabled disruption and, uh, and uh, globalization, I think, are, putting, are, are limiting, muting these inflationary forces. And the last comment, if you got a college education in this country, uh, or better, everything I see suggests this may be stressful for you, technology, but you'll adapt. Mm -hmm. If you've got a high school education or less, though, which is 46 million workers in this country, you are likely finding your job either being restructured or eliminated. And you'll find another job in this labor market, but unless you get retrained, which is a lot easier to say than to do, psychologically and everything else, you're likely to see your productivity and your income go from here to here. You may wind up in a service sector job and I think that's part of why you're seeing some of the experiences out in the, in the country about with income inequality, mm -hmm. wealth inequality, and the economy working differently for different people. I think it cuts very significantly by education levels. But I think that force, and so what's my, the punchline? I think inflation, I don't believe inflation is going to run away from us. I think you're going to see, particularly with the tariffs and input costs, mm -hmm. you're going to see it building. But I personally think that the, these more structural forces are not going away. If anything, they're intensifying. And I think they're going to have some muting effect on inflation. So I think we'll reach, we are reaching our 2% target. I, I am not sure. And I think it gives the Fed some latitude mm -hmm. in terms of how quickly we raise rates. Right. Um, but I think where it's going to get tricky for the Fed is if you see uh, – in the short run, inflation continued to pick up. Mm -hmm. How much of that is sustainable? How much of it is transitory? And can we tell which is which? And, and uh, I think that'll be a challenge for us. That's exactly what everyone's uh, thinking about. And that's you know, why, uh, why you're in the role you are, because of the, 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 the insight you have into these various countervailing factors. But let's come from the labor markets now to financial markets. So earlier in the year, uh, and, it's, and again, 2.25% federal funds rate. Uh, the conversation is about where is our star? Where's the natural rate? Where's the neutral rate? Uh, earlier in the year, people were lamenting the fact that uh, the yield curve was flattening out and yeah. recession right. was imminent, right? Now, now they're lamenting now, that it's the yield, not. Yield, the yield, the yield's are going too high. <laughs> How do you yeah. think about okay. the yield curve as you think about so the So let the me Marsh talk star about star. our star, and then I'll, yeah. I'll take the easier one first. We'll talk about the yield curve. <laughs> So what's the yield curve say to me? And we've got a number of financial people in this room. It says to me, the one and the two year, I think, are responding very heavily to what the Fed is saying. Uh, and I think a lot of our forward outlook in the dot plot, you know, our mm -hmm. summary of economic projections, that I believe that is heavily reflected in the one and two year. And if you want proof of that, we raised rates two weeks ago. Uh, one and two year didn't move very much, tells me a lot of that, what we're talking about is priced in. Right. Okay, so in the 280s, 290s already on the one and the two year. 
The longer end of the curve, the 10-year and the 30-year, are telling me, one, there's a lot of global liquidity, and we know that. Central bank balance sheet, pension fund assets have grown dramatically over the last 10 years. So there is some effect on the, on, on, on the curve uh, which you have to take into account. But the other thing I think the long end of the curve is telling me is back to where we started. Prospects for future growth are somewhat sluggish or uncertain. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously there's a dynamic process, but I think this flattening is a result of, and this is the challenge for the Fed, I believe we're meet, reading our, meet, reaching our dual mandate, we should be raising the Fed funds rate. It's reflected in the short end. The longer end is saying, Boy, A, there's a lot of money looking for safe assets, but also it's saying out your growth, I think, is a little more uncertain. Uh, so then let me get to, so that's what I think the curve is saying. Mm -hmm. so, what's, so, what's, so then to get to the neutral rate. So the reason we talk about this term, the neutral rate, which you won't find on your screen, is uh, it is so-called an inferred rate. Um, is it's the federal funds rate that at which theoretically we're neither restrictive or accommodative at the Fed. And the thing about the Fed funds rate, or the neutral rate, is it's theoretical and it is highly, talking about productivity being uncertain, it is highly imprecise and uncertain. And I think the smartest thing I can do in this seat is to acknowledge that. But despite, it's un despite the fact it's imprecise and uncertain, you still have to try to think about the concept mm -hmm. and where it might be. And so my own public comments have been that, that the, uh, the neutral rate re re revolves around a band. You know, and I said earlier this mm -hmm. year, just to throw out a number, two and a half to two and three quarters, it could be a little less. It could well be more than two and three quarters. And the smartest thing I could say about that is I reserve the right to keep changing my view. We do <laughs> lots of models. And I think the yield curve is a bit of a reality check for me also. And what, what our outlook is for the economy is a reality check. And the why, there are lots of reasons that the, the neutral rate's uncertain. The biggest one, I mentioned these structural drivers, aging demographics, mm -hmm. sluggish productivity, globalization, um, and I'd add a, a fourth, uh, the government debt to GDP, the growth in it is, is a tailwind for us right now. That tailwind could well turn into a headwind in the out years if we, if we conclude in the years ahead we have to moderate our debt growth. Uh, but the big, I'd say the biggest wild card that could make our star, the neutral rate, a little higher than it is now is if productivity, again, improves more than we think. Uh, and we'll have to see. Um, but what I've been saying, understand it's uncertain. If, if, you're, if you're meeting your dual mandate, uh, my own view is the only, the things I do, there's things I don't know, the things I do have conviction about. I don't think the Fed needs to be accommodative if we're uh, meeting our dual mandate. So I've been saying we should be gradually and patiently removing or the accommodation or raising the Fed funds rate until we get in the range of neutral, understanding that we're going to have to feel our way a bit to where neutral is. And so we're at two to two and a quarter. Um, I've been saying, I'll say what I've said publicly, I'm comfortable, uh, if we, uh, I'm comfortable over the next year at least, next through June, if we raise the Fed funds rate another three times, that would get us to two and three quarters to three percent. Uh, that doesn't seem unreasonable to me, assuming that our outlook stays the same. What we do beyond that, I've also been very candid in saying, I don't know. And I think uh, we'd be well served. Uh, and I don't need to make that judgment yet. And so I'm, I think we'd be well served to, uh, to keep revising our outlook. And the reason I'm cautious is I'm mindful of the fact it's, I want to be careful about making judgments in the height of the period where fiscal stimulus is having its greatest impact. And I'm conscious of the fact if we go out a year from now, the outlook may look very different than it does now. I don't know if it will, but I'm reserving the right to say maybe it will. And then I want to, once we get to neutral, we'll, we'll have to assess, do we go further? Or have we, in fact, uh, should we sit tight for a while? And I don't know the answer yet. And, uh, and so we'll have to see uh, spring, summer of next year. We'll, but this is what we'll, this is the questions that we're sort of debating and trying to figure out. So you mentioned fiscal policy. And you've highlighted a theme of 
thinking about cyclical versus structural factors. Yeah. And you've talked about the cycl cyclical effect, the short-term effect of the fiscal stimulus. CBL tells us next year we're looking at roughly a trillion dollars of debt. Right. A little more than 5% of GDP. Right. That's a pretty big number for the U.S. economy in a non-recessionary period. It's going to get bigger. So, so the first thing I did when I got in this job, I've got all, all my, sitting on my desk the CBO report, and we update it. And, we, and right now, debt held by the public of the U.S. government is 76% of GDP, and the present value of unfunded entitlements is $54 trillion. So the good news since the Great Recession is the household sector, it hasn't reduced debt so much, but it's sort of grown income to where we've spent eight or nine painful years deleveraging, and the household sector's in pretty good shape. Corporate sector's more leveraged, but the financial sector's deleveraged, so yes, there'll be more defaults in the next downturn. I don't know if it creates a systemic risk at mm -hmm. this point. But the one sector that's dramatically more leveraged than it was is the government sector. Right. So as a whole, we're a lot more leveraged in this country, which means we're a lot more interest rate sensitive. 100 basis points higher rates has an effect because we are a lot more leveraged as a country. And so the question before, and so normally when you're late in the, we're not, I, I think we have room to run in this economic cycle. But I'd say it's also fair to conclude we're, we, we're, we're late. I don't know what any we're in, but we're later in this economic cycle. Normally, when you're later in the economic cycle, you're finding ways to deleverage because you know in a recession, tax revenues will go down and you're going to deficits will go up. We've actually increased our leverage going into this, which is unusual historically. And so the concern is we could see deficits well in excess of a trillion dollars. And as we sit here this morning, every day that goes by, debt is growing faster than the economy. Yep. We're getting more leverage every, every hour we sit here. We have been fortunate that the U.S. is, you know, dollars the world reserve currency. When there's a uh, risk, you know, a flight to quality, people come to the Treasury. Um, and so we've been able to finance this large deficits and debt at relatively lower rates. But I think we'd be wise not to assume that that could go on forever. I think it'll go on for a while, mm -hmm. but uh, I think this is a concern. And you mentioned deficits. The, the, the other side of the fiscal deficit is the trade deficit, uh, which is sort of a natural outcome of the fact that we're, we're spending more than we're, 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 we're producing. Right. So, and you've talked about, a lot, you've alluded to globalization a few times. So just give us a sense to what extent, in your view, should and does the Fed take into account uh, external factors in thinking about this March dollar star, so to speak? So, so um, we spent a lot of time uh, at the Dallas Fed trying to think about and understand, and at the Fed generally trying to understand the global economy. Why? Because while we're central bank to the United States, uh, the world is, the economies are so interconnected today, and financial markets are certainly interconnected, that we know that fragility and turmoil in financial markets and economies around the world can easily spill over into the US. And a good example would be the first quarter of 2016, where you remember China had substantial turmoil, uh, substantial stock market uh, instability, capital outflows, and it caused a very quickly a tightening of global financial conditions which if it had continued, probably would have had effect of slowing economic growth. And you may note, remember that year the Fed stepped back from, we stepped back from our estimates of what we were gonna do with the Fed funds rate and eased back, and I think that was the right thing to do. So, so we've gotta watch that very, very carefully. Um, and we're, it's something on the, we've gotta be aware of uh, financial instability around the world and economic instability, if it gets severe enough, can transmit back here. So uh, obviously I'm watching Argentina, uh, Turkey, uh, but I'm also aware that their exposure to dollar denominated debt is unusual. From a, a lot of countries learn their lesson from the 90s painfully, you know, early 90s, I remember it painfully myself, where people have learned, uh, you got to be very careful about dollar denominated. China has a very high savings rate, and with all their issues and their leverage increasing, uh, th th you know that helps be a shock absorber for them. So we're watching it carefully. In terms of the last comment I'd make on globalization, though, 15 years ago, if your job got disrupted in this country, it was well 
may well have been due to globalization. Mm -hmm. You know, outsourcing, yep. shoe industry, we can go industry by industry. Roll forward to today. Uh, today with the integrated supply chains, the logistical arrangements, sophistication, and, and the way companies have adapted, if your job is being disrupted today in the United States, it may be attributed to globalization, but all our work at the Dallas Fed suggests it's far more likely to do to technology, probably happening within the United States, and the fact of the matter is, um, if we get that diagnosis wrong, we're going to make the wrong policy prescriptions. We view today, at Dallas Fed, our view is globalization is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're less than 5% of the world's population. We need to grow because we've got so much debt. Globalization is an opportunity. And so we're hopeful that, uh, that we will have, despite what's going on, the, you know, the short-term uh, fight skirmishes, whatever adjective you want to use, global trade is very critical to the future of the United States, we believe, because we, it, it's one of the ways we can grow faster. Before I open up to the audience, I want to ask you one last question. I can't resist. Yeah. Yesterday, with the Nobel Prize in Economics was announced, yeah. you're wearing NYU Stern purple. One, yeah. one of our faculty members won the prize, along with William Nordhaus. And interestingly, the thing about the prize was one of the faculty members who won, Paul Romer, won for his work on innovation and growth which basically says the government needs to do more to encourage the development of new ideas because there's a positive externality that's right. generated. Right. William Nordhaus won because his work has basically suggested the government needs to do more to get people to internalize the negative externalities yeah. of the growth that they produce through the new ideas on the environment. Right. You thought a lot about, I know the latter issue, the climate change issue, you also thought about innovation. Yeah. Any thoughts you have for us on so, the interaction of these two things? So full, full disclosure, and, and, and as some of you may know, when I was at Harvard, I was co-chair of the sustainability effort for the university. They paired me with a physics professor, uh, and Harvard had a greenhouse gas emissions target of 30% reduction from 2006 to 2016, and I co-chaired that effort, university-wide effort. I was supposed to be a leadership professor, and so they paired me with a physics professor, and so I learned a lot about this subject. And, and we talk a lot about this at the Fed, and this is a classic, this is another structural change, uh, which I actually think could be an opportunity economically for the United States. We are a leader in the world in uh, sustainability, sustainability technology. It is going to be, I believe, a dramatic growth industry in the world. Any of you who've traveled, which many of you have, to Shanghai and Beijing, you don't need to be there very long to know they have a substantial, and they think, the government, they have a substantial need to clean up and improve the air quality and the environment. Uh, and so this is a good example of investments now can not only help GDP growth, they can help reduce the probability of severe tail risks. And we were talking at breakfast, some of those tail risks don't look so tail oriented anymore. You know, we're having more frequency of higher climate for the last 18 years. Hurricanes affecting us substantially along the Gulf. It's affecting energy prices. We're paying an economic cost. And so I think this is one of the other structural drivers that um, in the short run, you may be able to uh, neglect it, but in the longer run, I think it's not only uh, something that could reduce tail risk, I think it's an economic opportunity where we could grow faster, particularly in the United States, because we have a global competitive advantage in this area. So I think it's an opportunity, actually, depending on how we pursue it. I think it's a great point to open up for questions for the floor. Starting with fellows. Starting with fellows. Are you seeing any ECNY fellows with questions? The lady in the gray dress right here. Fire away. Go ahead. Okay. So on the energy, the long and short of it, we've been we were in a global probably oversupply situation for 15, 2016, maybe a little bit of 17. Uh, U.S. went through painful cuts, and the shale industry probably cut net a million barrels a day of production. Very painful. Uh, while that was going on, Russia and other countries outside the U.S. were actually increasing production. So what happened is global demand kept growing. So long and short, we now think we're in a fragile equilibrium where supply demand is, is relatively balanced, and I'll go through some exceptions to that. Um, 
But we're at the point that shale is now, the, world, the growth in the world demand, which we think is about a million and a half barrels a day is the number we're using. Uh, even with growth in alternatives, the world is getting more and more reliant on shale for the incremental, to supply this incremental growth. Shale is now, we've had about a million barrels a day net increase in, in U.S. production. 70% of that growth is coming from the Permian Basin. There are people shortages, infrastructure shortages, pipeline shortages. Tariffs may have even slowed, according to people in the industry, that. And, and you've got a very rapid decline curve in the shale. You know, the first one or two years, you have a substantial decline, which means if you want to keep net increasing production a million barrels a year, you've got to grow a lot more in new drilling than a million barrels. And so people who are in the shale business tell me they're skeptical hmm. how fast shale can grow. Permian Basin's gonna grow dramatically. Will it grow fast enough to keep up with global demand? We're not sure. And then you overlay geopolitical issues, Venezuela, uh, the Iranian right. sanctions and Iranian barrels, whether you think it's 500,000 or a million of barrels coming off market, that's a lot for us to replace. So our own judgment at the Dallas Fed, and we've been warning this now for a couple of years, and Bill, is, Bill uh, Dudley's heard me say that we think the price risk is more to the upside, and we may well be in a global undersupply situation within the next three to five years. Um, and so we just need to be braced for that. Now, the fact we're, more energy, we're producing more of it here will help mitigate that. But consumers close to 70% of the U.S. economy and higher energy prices um, obviously affects the consumer. But, uh, but we're, we're watching this situation very carefully. We may get through this equilibrium period without a spike, but if you had a geopolitical event or you had more barrels come off the market than they're expected, w there's not much spare capacity in the world based on our analysis. Uh, and so we're watching it carefully. Next question. Uh, Settle over by the window to the right here. Rob, good morning. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, could you give us a sense of NAFTA, for those of us that haven't read it, assuming that it actually gets ratified? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? How good is it for Texas, and how good is it for the country, or is it just cosmetic? Okay, so in, in, we do a lot of work, and I've been through, I will start by saying I've been through both the Canada Agreement and the, NAFTA, and the Mexico Agreement in, with, in great detail, and my team has. I think it's probably more productive for me publicly, though, in the job I'm in as central banker, not to critique pros and cons, other than to say uh, we're glad it got done. Uh, um, is it a dramatic change from the provisions of the Trans-Pacific Pipeline? Not that we can see, and I won't, I'll leave it at that. Uh, what we're focused on as, a, as a central bankers is U.S. global competitiveness. It's not enough to add a job in a city or a state or in this country if it's not globally competitive, because hmm. it won't exist five years from now. It's just a matter of time. We believe this agreement still is sufficient to allow us to keep building global competitiveness. There will be some challenges to it in terms of local content, the minimum wage, the $16 an hour. Canada be part of the agreement is essential on some of these mathematical formulas. Having Canada in the agreement, I think it makes it dramatically, we're not, we weren't sure how it would be managed without Canada in the agreement. So we're glad in the place we're in, and I want to be constructive and say, we're, we're just glad it's getting done. Is it a dramatic, game-changing uh, agreement from where we were? Uh, I'll leave that to others, uh, but we're glad it's gotten done because we think it's essential to U.S. competitiveness. Great. Uh, lady on the table here. So you mentioned that there was a $3 trillion funding gap for infrastructure. What do you think is the most effective way to address that gap, and how much of a priority should it be with regard to the other priorities that are on the table right now? So it, interestingly, it may not be that there's a funding gap. It just may be we just haven't spent. We need you know, roads, bridges, Wi-Fi is part of that. Uh, our own analysis has been for certain types of projects, those that generate revenue, 
Uh, and even uh, we were actually involved in some Wi-Fi projects along the border. A lot of it could be done with private money. It doesn't necessarily take government money, but I think it's 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 very tr it's it's turned out to be trickier. So the money is not the problem. Let me just start there. There's plenty of money. We talked about global liquidity, desire for safe assets, infrastructure in the United States. I think if we there's plenty of money globally that would fund it and earn accept good returns. I think the issue I've learned is a lot more local fees, local licenses, e easements. Uh, other, other issues that are not necessarily economic to get these done. Uh, some of it will take government money. Some may, actually with a little bit of government money, you could do most of it with private sector money. My guess is you just need to make it a priority number one. You know, I'm learning, this is true at the Fed, if you want to get something done at the Federal Reserve, it better be one of your top one or two priorities. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the business, you'd say it better be one of your top three or four priorities. I've learned in the government, it better be number one or number two. <laughs> I mean, maybe just number one. It's harder to get things done. And I think uh, I talked about skills training. Uh, I talked about pre-K and infrastructure. Those would probably be three of the things that are essential. Uh, but it, it'll take, it is not easy, I've learned, uh, to get some of these projects done. Uh, we've got one in Texas we were talking about at breakfast this morning, which is compelling, which is a train from Dallas to Houston. And the, and the team on that has been working for years just to get it to the point where it actually can get launched. These things are very complicated locally to get done. So you need, anytime you need coordination between city, state, federal, you know it's gonna be difficult. But I think that's why if it's a top priority for the country, mm -hmm. you can overcome that, but it probably needs to be a, a, right at the top of the list to make progress. And we just haven't seemed to do that yet. We have time for one more question for President Kaplan. Gentleman with the gray suit back here. Oh, yes. Hi, Bob. Daniel Moss from Bloomberg. Good to see you Good again. See you. Just a two-part question related to your remarks on China. They appeared to begin the year still emphasizing deleveraging. Yeah. Uh, to what extent has that tilted really now toward more of an easing bias? And having said that, why is there a reluctance to let the currency depreciate further to reflect slower growth? So, so let's take these things in pieces. So the, the, the punchline, while, while trade is very important in the United States, important to Texas and the US, it is a much smaller percentage of GDP than it is for China. Trade's much more important to them than it is to us. They're trying to build domestic consumption, but they're, it's, this is years, this restructuring of their economy is years in the making. I think the estimate is they wanna move something like 300 million people from rural areas to cities or turn the rural areas into cities. And so they're on this long path and they have been trying to meet a GDP target every year of roughly six and a half percent by increasing debt to GDP. So their leverage sector across all sectors has been going up. And to your point, in terms of doing reforms, they were hoping to begin deleveraging, maybe moving more toward letting GDP float somewhat. Um, and I think this trade, these issues going on right now have sort of put that into question where I think they feel while we're in the middle of this, whatever it is we're in the middle of, they need to stimulate more. So you're, this, tr this talk about deleveraging, they're probably increasing their debt to GDP in order to, and they're more, uh, they, they maybe want more strongly politically now than before to meet that 6.5% target. Um, and so this is probably, delay, this will delay some of the progress. We have been saying, and I've been saying publicly, I don't think increasing debt to GDP as a way to grow GDP in China is sustainable indefinitely. The world's gonna to have to get used to lower growth from China. But politically, it's a very hard thing to manage. Uh, on the currency, last point, uh, their currency has depreciated down about 10% since this started. But, but as you, I think you alluded to, their great fear is capital outflows. They have very tight capital controls, which they beefed up in early 2016. And so, they actually have been trying to support their currency because they're worried about the capital outflows and instability from that. So this is a very tricky, challenging 
situation. Uh, the qu issue for the United States is while we're fighting this, and it's not, it's not so much, for me, it's not so much the trade deficit, but intellectual property rights, technology transfer, other issues, um, does some of this turn into instability, which circles back and spills over to the United States? It has not yet, and we're hopeful it won't, but we're watching it very, very carefully. Rob, well, thank you for a really insightful thank conversation. You, Peter. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And just before you leave, I wanted to give you, uh, uh, share a few announcements about upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow, UCNY will be hosting Ian Reed, CEO and Chairman of the Board of Pfizer with Glenn Hutchins, co-founder of North Island, followed on October 11th by conversation with Reed Hoffman, co-founder of LinkedIn and partner at Greylock. On October 16th, we'll have Barry Diller, Chairman and Senior Executive, IAC and Expedia, on October 18th, we'll have Randy Quarles, Vice Chairman for Supervision of the Federal Reserve. And on October 19th, we'll have Mark Carney, Governor of the Bank of England. Again, thank you and thank you. enjoy your day. Thank you very much. Thanks thank you. Great job. Thank you.